Thank you, Mrs. Jordan. Appreciate that. It's great. Uh, happy New Year. This is my first my first Sabbath back since since New Year's. So I I feel like I get to preach a New Year's sermon. Show of hands, really quick, just for my curiosity's sake. How many of you made a New Year's resolution? Raise your hand high if you made a New Year's resolution. Very good. Show of hands, just for my sake. How many of you did not make a New Year's resolution? Thank you. I just want to make sure you're willing to show you raise your hands. Very good. <laughs> All right. How many of you have heard that you should not make New Year's resolutions in the past? How many of you have heard that statement before? Raise your hand. Very good. I have heard that too, and today I want to share a story to start the sermon all about that. I have a friend who told me that he has made a New Year's resolution this year, and it was a very noble, a very good New Year's resolution. Is my mic on? I don't want to repeat a prayer meeting. You guys can't hear me. Justin, am I good? I ask you because you're the one who's going to be like, you've got to repeat everything you said. <laughs> okay, good. All right. I have a friend. He made a New Year's resolution, and it was a very noble, it was a very pure New Year's resolution. He has kids, and uh, any parent who has kids can probably relate to this. He made the resolution that he was going to speak softly to his kids. Any of you parents relate to that concept of needing to speak a little softer to your kids? So he makes this resolution, and he's telling me all about this resolution. And he's excited about it, and of course, this is he's telling me this on January 5th. And uh, I said, hey, I'm so glad that you've made a resolution and you've stuck to it all the way through January 5. Good for you. Because in my mind, I am thinking, I never make New Year's resolutions. I was, in fact, I was told not to. I thought, what a waste of time, because usually you make a resolution and you break it either the day after or maybe you make it a week, maybe you make it a month. But at any, reason, any rate, you end up breaking this resolution. And we've all heard the sermon, at least most of us have heard the sermon in here, I saw the hands. You shouldn't make a resolution, let your yay be yay, and your nay nay, and that's what God wants, and it's a waste of time, and it's really not even spiritual to make a New Year's resolution. And that's the same attitude I have, but as he's telling me this story, he's super excited. He said not to burst his, burst his bubble, and I start evaluating that concept, and God shows me that I'm wrong. I'm partially wrong. In fact, I've come to the conclusion you should make New Year's resolutions and that you should continually make resolutions. Now let me explain. The story is told that comes to us from the town of Flagstaff, Arizona. The teacher in a certain public school is walking up and down the aisles in her schoolroom as a child, as the children prepared their lessons. She noticed one ambitious young boy uh, writing something on the flyleaf of his history book. Being curious, she walked slowly by his desk and glanced over his shoulder as she passed, did her eyes deceive her? Was a boy of 10 thinking such thoughts? She walked back past his desk again to get another look to make sure she saw what she saw. The book was open, and this is what she read. Henry F. Ashurst, state senator from Arizona. Little had she thought that such thoughts were going through Henry's mind. Could such a small boy be planning that someday he would be a state senator? It was just a boyish resolution, all set by a good boy of 10. It was a hard, long road for Henry. He worked as a lumberjack, as a cowboy, as a hod carrier. That's someone who carries bricks and mortar for masons. A clerk, cashier and a lawyer, but he never forgot his dream of someday being a state senator for Arizona. That same resolve he made when just a boy. The way to right doing, I'm sorry, that resolution he made when he was only 10 years old helped him through those times, and he finally became a state senator of Arizona. But suppose he had not resolved in his heart to be a state senator. Suppose he had never made that resolution. Suppose he had never dreamed, dared to dream to be something that he thought he should be and then resolved to follow his dreams. Would he have become a state senator? The, day, the, the way to right doing is not downhill. 
It just doesn't fortunately or serendipitously fall into our laps. We do not coast into the town of goodness and complete surrender to God. All of the goodness and surrender that has ever taken place has been accomplished by the result of resolutions. If we make progress, it is because we have set a goal for ourselves. This is a concept that is without, this is not a concept that's without merit in the Bible. In case you need a Bible verse to prove what I am telling you, that God does indeed endorse making resolutions, open your Bibles this morning and turn to Daniel chapter 1. Open your Bibles this morning and turn, turn to Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. You're going to see that God indeed endorses resolutions. And if we make those resolutions and we follow through those resolutions through his power, God blesses those resolutions abundantly. Daniel chapter 1 in verse 8. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. Now you guys know this story. Daniel and his three friends have been taken captive. They have seen family members die, no doubt. They have been led through the desert as slaves in prison, chained and bound together all the way to this country of Babylon. They stand before a fierce king who is wicked in his heart, and they know that if they cross and they can be killed at any time, they're uncertain of their future, and they have been chosen by the king himself to go through school and eat his food. Daniel and his friends survey the situation and they look over the food they're supposed to eat and they come up with a problem. The problem is, is the food that they are supposed to eat, that the king has given them to eat, God has said, don't eat it. In our lives, many times we come to a crossroads just like Daniel and his friends. The world sets before us choices. It tells us we must do this. It mandates that we must follow along with its precepts, its concepts, its ways. But God says, don't do it. And like Daniel and his friends, we're forced to make a, solution, uh, to make a choice. Daniel and his friends, in, in verse 8, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel did what? He purposed. New King James, all the modern translations, Daniel resolved in his heart he would not eat the king's meat. Now, don't get me wrong. There are meats that God said you could eat, but there are meats that God said you could not eat. And the king put some of these unclean foods before Daniel, foods that God had said are not fit for human consumption. And Daniel was forced to make this choice, and being led astray, he had every excuse not to make it. But he resolved, he purposed, he made a resolution that no matter what happened to him, his friends purposed, they resolved, they made a resolution that no matter what happened to them, they were going to follow the dictates of God and not the concepts of man. They understood the concept that if you stand for nothing, you fall for everything. And I'm here to tell you today, if you don't make a resolution to stand for right, if you don't make a resolution to follow your God, if you don't make a resolution to obey what he tells you to do, you'll never obey what he tells you to do. As we survey the current climate of our society, as we take a look at what's going on around us, we all watched the news, and if we didn't watch the news, it popped up on our phones. We saw the mob take over, try to take over the Capitol building, and were successful at least for a moment. A police officer lost his life in that conflict. Many others had to be treated in the hospital. Four protesters lost their lives. If you ask my opinion, it was heresy, it was sedition to take over a Capitol building to stop government process. Whether you agree with the cause or not, or you sympathize with the cause or not, it's sedition. What led to this? It seems to me like those who are in power are looking for much more, and the calls for radical social changes are echoing around the world like nothing I've ever known or seen before. When you think about it, Protestant Reformation 
and an appreciation of conscience took me time to get a foothold and actually climax and change. You know, if you go back and you look at the medieval times and you think about Protestant Reformation and how long it took for the concept of freedom of worship to get established, it took hundreds of years. When we think of social, social inequality and bringing a change to social inequality and the end of slavery, it took hundreds of years for that to be accomplished. However, now we see massive social changes taken a year, months, and in some cases a single day if it follows a tragedy of some sort. Who would ever thought that you could be labeled a terrorist and all of your rights as an American citizen could be stripped from you and you wouldn't even have the right to a fair and speedy trial. You wouldn't have the Miranda rights that are afforded to us because the government can take those from you just because they deem you a terrorist and they don't even need a judge's warrant to do that. All stripped from one major event. The ability to influence massive numbers of people is hitting a crescendo. This all indicates to me that we are very near to the rise of the Antichrist. Right now in our country, we have mass division. The only time I can think, the only time I can think of where we had as much division in our country as we do today was during and right after the Civil War, a time where we know from spirit of prophecy that Jesus would have come if his people were ready. Today we see that same division played out. When you mix our division with a cancel, a cancel culture society, where well, there's no room for a difference of opinion because your opinion cancels mine, so your opinion is hateful and must be squashed out, or your opinion is terribly wrong and will lead to dire consequences if allowed, it must be stomped down. It leads to nothing but fighting and more fighting, to riots and civil dissonance. We see the groups, we see the far left groups, we see the far right groups, and whether you agree with one cause or another, they're still fighting. They're not going about it Christ's way. They're not trying to use peace and love to affect change. They're trying to accomplish it by force. Division. I'm not allowed to disagree with you because if I disagree with you, it's hate speech. It's hate crime. Or there's dire consequences that will change our lives as we know it, and we can't allow that to happen. We must eliminate that kind of thinking. There can be no difference of opinion, but there must be opposition because we can't agree as one. All this great country needs now is someone, anyone, who can bring unity. wonder who that will be. I wonder who would step up into that role. Who would be willing to be the man to bring unity to our society? Oh, you've heard his comments. You know who I'm talking about. How he so freely gives opinions about how governments should run societies. How he talks about strengthening families and counteracting global warming by taking a day off a week. How he makes his comments advising societies and civil unions to make sure all people groups are treated fairly and that we should pay everyone fairly. Now these concepts are not bad ideas in and of themselves, but we know from history what his true purpose is. We know from history what his agenda is. We know that it comes with a desire for power and control. Sure, he's not trying to tell world leaders what to do per se, but there is a tone of, I'm not telling you to do this, but this is what I would do if I were you. You know what I'm talking about. That's playing out around our society right now. It's playing around in our country right now. It's going on in the world right now. And if you don't think that there's a major power change, if you don't think there's a major shift in our societies all around the world leading to a culmination in Revelation 13, you're deceived. The pace has quickened. We've accelerated towards that day. The question really isn't, are we close anymore? The question isn't even, is this happening? We know it is. 
we shouldn't be asking the question, when will we see these things any longer because we see them taking place? We should be asking a very different question. We should be asking a very personal question. The question we need to be asking right now is, am I ready? Am I ready? Now, you might be sitting in your seat right now thinking in your head, oh, Jay, you're such an alarmist. Just like a typical Seventh-day Adventist, you seize hold of every crisis going on around us and you spin it to tell us that Jesus is coming soon and we better get our lives in order. But let me ask you a question if you're thinking that. How are you supposed to sound the alarm without being an alarmist? Moving off of that question, my last question still remains. Are you ready? Am I ready? Do you stand out? Do I stand out? This is an important question, especially if Jesus is coming soon. You may ask why. It's because Jesus himself tells us in Revelation 12, 11, that those who overcome are going to inherit the, the heavenly kingdom. That implies that those who do not overcome will not inherit the heavenly kingdom. Again, in Revelation 21, 7, 8, the Bible teaches us that he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Just one more chapter over in Revelation 22, 14, and 15. John, through inspiration of Jesus, writes, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into that city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. In case you are wondering who the dogs are, let me be very clear, it's not talking about a canine. It's not talking about a four-legged animal. Isaiah is very clear when it tells us that the wolf will lie with the child. Wolf is a dog. It is a canine. They are going to be in heaven. This dog that John is referring to in Revelation that sits outside the gates, he's speaking of slumbering pastors, of lazy pastors who don't do their job and tell their people of the warnings coming up and tell their people to get out of sin because while God always has a place for the sinner, he doesn't reserve any room. Doesn't reserve any room for sin. And John says, outside of those gates are those pastors that didn't do their job. And brothers and sisters, I want to be very clear about this. I don't want to be that pastor. I want to be inside with all of you. And I've got to tell you, the Bible is very clear about this. It says, overcomers will inherit the kingdom of heaven overcomers he said outside are the sinners outside are the ones who practice an abominable thing now i get it we're all sinners but let me tell you there's no safety in not following conviction of your conscience if the Holy Spirit is telling you you need to change in your life, there's no comfort in staying in that place of not changing. You need to change. And if the Holy Spirit is talking to you about an aspect of your life, I suggest to you you make a resolution to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is coming soon. And he's made it very clear in his end time book that only those who overcome are going to go with him. In Revelation 18, 3 and 4, Jesus calls everyone out of Babylon, the harlot who makes the nations drunk with the wrath of her fornication and has caused the kings of the earth to commit fornication with her. Jesus says, come out of her, my people, that you do not partake in her sins. Fornication is the sin of unfaithfulness. And in this context, God is talking about his people who are fornicating with Babylon, with confusion, who think it's okay to live and practice sin. He says, you're the ones I'm talking to. You need to come out. Paul tells us what this looks like in 1 Corinthians 6. Why don't you turn there with me? 1 Corinthians 6. I want you guys to read this for yourself in the Bible. 
I, I understand that this sermon could, could have, a, have a, a, a tone of stepping on toes. I know it could be offensive. Some of you are getting angry, and some of you are happy that you're not getting angry, but you should be getting angry. I'm here to tell you this sermon should be speaking to every single one of us. Because raise your hands really quick if you can tell me right now that you're completely surrendered to Jesus Christ. Raise your hand right now if you can tell me that you've overcome in him. Because I can tell you I'm striving for that. But there's a work to do. Paul tells us what it looks like when we come out of the world. Paul tells us who will be and not be in heaven in this verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. And he says in verse 9, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Did you catch that? Yes. Now don't miss this next part. Don't miss this next part because this next part should be talking about you. Verse 11. As such were some of you, but you were washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He says, you were once one of those. I was once one of those, but I was washed by Jesus Christ. He called me out of the world. And why did he call me out of the world? Because the angelic beings in heaven don't act like that. A Christian who was following Jesus should not act like that. Paul says don't do that because they will not inherit the kingdom. Those who come out of that lifestyle, those who cling to Jesus, they say, Jesus, you're talking to me. I'm the one who needs your blood to wash my sins. I'm the one who needs your power to overcome. And I'm going to cling to you and let you do that in my life. But he's not talking about those ones who come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to save me, but do nothing to overcome in their lives. He says that won't happen. Paul says you were once one of those, but now you've been washed. You've been called out according to Jesus. We can't take our sins with us to heaven. John. John speaks of the world to us a bit in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, John, the apostle John, the one whom Jesus loved, the one who we get such great assurances from, such great promises from, in John, 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17, he tells us about the world. He tells us how the Father feels about the world, how God interacts with the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Did you catch that? If you love the world, the love of God is not in you, according to inspiration. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is, is, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The lust of the flesh, the indulgence of evil. He says that's of the world, it's not of God. The lust of the eyes, the beholding of evil, what we put in our eyes, what entertainment we choose to watch. He says that's not of God. That's of the world. And he says the pride of life, gathering materialistic things, covetousness, selfishness. He says that's of the world, but it's not of God. And if your heart is in the world, the love of God is not in it. That's what John says. If it's not, if those concepts are not from God, where are they from? In the book Fundamentals of Education, 
came across a quote I wanted to share with you. I found this message from the author. It's found on page 289 of Fundamentals of Education. The author poses a statement that's worthy of contemplation. She writes, There are many in the church, where? In the church. Who at heart belong to the world. Now, we know this is true because Jesus says the wheat and tares will grow together. There are many in the church who at heart belong to the world, but God calls upon those who claim to believe the advanced truth to rise above the present attitude of the popular churches of today. Where is the self-denial? Where is the cross-bearing that Christ has said should characterize his followers? The reason we have had so little influence upon unbelieving relatives and associates is that we have manifested little decided difference in our practices from those of the world. Mercy. The reason why we have so little influence amongst our family members and associates is because there's no difference between them and us. They think we're just like them that like to go to church because we have some social club here. Is church a social club for you? Don't answer my questions right now. I want you to know that the only reason why I'm preaching this message is because Jesus preached this message to me. He said, Jay, you're the one I'm talking to. You can share this if you want to, but you're the one I'm talking to. So don't feel like I'm sitting up here judging you. Every one of us should self-evaluate of what we're hearing. Because this is real. I'm not talking about who's saved and who's not saved. I'm talking about you having your own personal experience with Jesus Christ and with the Holy Spirit and with the Father. And as they try to put their love into your heart, are you allowing them? Or is the love of the world choking out their love? That's only a question that you can answer. It's my job to give a message. It's your guy's job to go home and do something with it. The reason we have had so little influence upon unbelieving relatives, and I know I read that and I'm reading it again. The reason why we've had so little influence upon unbelieving relatives and associates is that we have manifested little decided difference in our practices from those of the world. Parents, what did I say? Yeah. Need to awake and purify their souls by practicing the truth in their home life. When we reach the standard that the Lord would have us reach, worldlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. We are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. That verse is found in 1 Corinthians 4.9. How do you look to the world around you today? Do others consider you an extremist? Do they say, there goes a fanatical? Do they comment about you that you are too heavenly minded to be any earthly good? You ever heard that said about you? You know, when I first became a Christian, I sold my TV. Actually, I didn't sell my TV. I gave it to my nephew so he would come to church with me. But I sold my stereo system, everything that went with it so that I could help God's cause. It alarmed my friends so much so that they had an intervention, if you will. They called me over to the house, a group of them, and said, we heard that you gave away your TV and you sold your stereo. If you're hurting for money, we can help you. We'll loan you some money. And when I told them I didn't do it because I was hurting for money, I did it because I wanted to get rid of it and change my ways and give the money to the cause of God. They said, oh, you're a fanatic. You're an extremist. You've gone too far. When I told my stepdad that I wasn't going to take a job because it required me to work on Sabbath, 
He said, no, 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 no. It's fine if you accept Jesus, whatever. But listen, you, you can't expect him to expect that of you. And I said, well, his word tells me that. And he says, well, don't be a fanatical. Don't be an extremist. Now you're all looking, you have a smile on your face. But I'm sad when I tell that story. Because that was 15 years ago and no one's called me an extremist lately. No one's called me a fanatical. It hasn't happened. Why hasn't it happened? It's not because people changed. It's because I did. I became more like the world when I left it. Sorry. After I left the world... I started becoming more like the world. They even went as far as sending a woman to talk to me who was a Christian, to set me straight, to let me know that faith didn't have to be radical, that I was just too zealous for my faith because I was a newborn Christian, and it was her responsibility as an older sister in the faith to mentor me, not to be extreme in my faith as she was doing lines and taking hits of crack pipes in front of me. It was her job to teach me not to be extreme in my faith. I didn't make any changes, and they made fun of me. Worse yet, I had fellow church members that said I was a fanatical. I was too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Maybe you've said that about people you know. Maybe you've said that about church members or thought about them. That is preparing this and contemplating that last quote we just read. The Lord directed me to Daniel chapter 3. You guys don't have to go there. You know the story all so well. Daniel chapter 3 takes place on the plain of Dura. King Nebuchadnezzar has just been told that someday his vast empire is going to belong to another king. It's going to belong to another nation. Not his family members, but another nation. Not even Babylon, but some other nation. And he can't handle it. He doesn't like the news. He'll do anything to keep that from happening. So he decides that he's going to set up a festival, if you will. He's going to have a ceremony, and he's going to invite everybody out there as a way to assimilate them in to Babylonian culture. And so they'll see how great it is and never want to leave it so that Babylon will always be Babylon. And you know the story. They have people gathered from every nation, kindred, and tongue there. Jews who have just been taken captive years before are on this plain of Dura. Some of them leaders in the kingdom, various different jobs for the king. And the music starts. And they all start dancing. And I imagine they're laughing. And they're having a great time. But they're instructed when the music stops. They're supposed to stop what they're doing. Bow down on the ground to an image that Nebuchadnezzar set up of himself of solar gold. The music stops, and you know the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand tall. They stand firm. They refuse to bow to idolatry. They refuse to bow to this king's image, to this king's way. They refuse to be assimilated into the culture of Babylon because they've resolved in their heart to follow the God that preserved them from Jerusalem. This obviously catches the king's attention. And I can imagine that all through the crowd, all around them, they can hear the whispers. Oh, there's those three again. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What fanatics. Why can't they just bow down and tie their shoe? Why do they always have to be different? Why are they so jealous for Jesus? 
Why do they stand up when everybody else is bowing down? Don't they know that they're making us look bad? They're extremists. And they get called before the king. And they get asked by the king to bow down to the image. The king loves these three men. Because of their extreme faith, he's found them very worthy. He's found them very purposeful for him. So he says, I'll give you another chance, but they say, we don't want your chance. We're resolved. We purposed in our heart when we first got here that we were going to be faithful to God and to his dictates and not to societies around us. And the king says, throw them in the furnace. And in that act of extreme faith, in that act of fanaticism, they turn the entire known world to worship God. I want to be a fanatic. I want to be an extremist. Jesus is coming soon. And he says, those who overcome will inherit the kingdom. And I know I can do better. I can do better. What about you? What about you? Is God talking to you today? Is he asking you for a full surrender? Is there something in your life that Jesus is asking you to leave behind so you can walk fully with him? Is there something Jesus is asking you to change in? Is the Holy Spirit revealing to you that there are areas of your heart that are not completely God's yet? Do you stand out in the world? Or are you part of the crowd? They say every journey begins with the first step. However, that's not true. Every journey begins by resolving to take that first step. Today I want to resolve to be like Jesus. I want to be so much like Jesus that people call me a fanatic. I want to be so much like Jesus that the world thinks I'm an extremist because I know that the closer I am to Jesus, the more I act like him, the more I look like them, like him, the better chance I have for them to be saved. How about you? Our closing hymn is number 315. I went a little long today, so I'll walk out during the the first stanza, but John will come up and lead you in a closing prayer after the song is over. But I want you not to just sit there and listen to the music. I want you to take the hymn book out. Open up to number 315. Read the words as you hear the music. Read them. Warren's still setting that up. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? 